power there is referring to mighty displays of supernatural acts, all right? What is a sign, which we're going to study extensively in the Gospel of John? What's a sign? When, you ride, when you're driving down the street, what's a sign tell you? Where to go, what to do. These are, these are signs that point, and they are pointing to Antichrist as the one who is the Christ, okay? He does supernatural acts, and he, there are signs that point to him as God. And wonders refers to getting astonishing results. It is, a res, it is something that causes people to wonder, how can that be? So he's going to do powerful miracles, which are going to point to him as a supernatural being. And in, that, in those miracles, he's going to create wonder. People will be shocked. They will be astonished. And people will come to the conclusion that eventually they will come to the conclusion that he is, in fact, a divine entity. The Jews will conclude that he is Messiah. People... Other people will conclude that he is God, and he will set himself up as God, and the world will fall at his feet and worship him. And eventually then, he will consume all the other world's religions, and the whole world will bow down to him, and anybody who doesn't will be destroyed. He'll do mighty acts, pointing to himself as a supernaturally energized being, exciting eliciting astonishment and wonder from the world. After all, he will resurrect, right? He has to, he, he, that's how far, <clears throat> that's how far that his charade goes. I'll show you. I'll tell you why. Okay. okay. Now that word lying in the Greek should be attached to all three. Lying power, lying signs, and lying wonders, okay? In your outline, the word is lying. It's, uh, it's the word lying in the Greek, it's the word pseudos, and it just means uh, fake. So it, 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 what, what is important here is to understand the effect of the miracles not the nature of the miracles. It's more important to understand these aren't false miracles in the sense that they're fake. These are supernatural, satanic miracles. Not as great as the miracles of God, but enough to convince people that this guy is, in fact, a god. So uh, when, it, when, when it uses that word lying, the idea is, is that the effect of the lying powers, lying signs, and lying wonders is to make people believe a lie. In the, in the Greek, it's, a, it's, it's more obviously written, but English, English has a hard time expressing that. So in verse 10, it says, And with all unrighteous deception, that is, with all unrighteousness, that, the idea behind this, that is, with all that unrighteousness can do to deceive, all the deceit, all that unrighteousness has at its disposal, all the deception that wickedness at its worst can produce, this whole operation is a lie. It's all false, and it lures people to believe that Antichrist is, in fact, the world's savior, the world's messiah. And even non-religious people are going to see him as someone who can solve the world's problems, someone who can fix the world. If somebody came to the forefront tomorrow who could fix all the world's problems, what do you think would happen? I'd be in heaven. <laughs> yeah. But the world would worship at their feet. If somebody, if they genuine believe, genuinely believe somebody could do that, okay? Especially if they had, were able to produce supernatural miracles. Why is that because the world is so heated and so misinformed and, and just easily believes its own truth and, 
Amen. Um, Amen. Yeah. Yeah. It is easier. So they're going to believe that the man to deliver the world from all its troubles is this Antichrist. And religious people are going to believe, uh, religious people will be deceived and believe that this is God's man, that this is the world's redeemer. And he's going to use his ability to deceive his wickedness to deceive, and he'll do it, and he'll be successful. Why? What's ma the major reason? Because remember, the restraining power is now gone. The Holy Spirit, although not, the Holy Spirit's still here, right? Because the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. It has to be here. It's everywhere. But the Holy Spirit has been restrained from restraining evil, and so he will be much more successful. And with evil not being diluted, with it being unrestrained, he will have great power to deceive. So Paul says to the church in Thessaloniki, I'm, I'm filling you in on these details on this man who is to come. And here are these details about his coming before the day of the Lord comes. Okay? So you'll understand and he wants to talk to him about one more, th one other aspect of his career, and that is his influence. And this isn't this part isn't very long. In verse ten, he comes. He continues, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So the extent of his influence is seen on those who perish. Literally, those who are uh, perishing. Uh, the way it's written in the Greek, uh, uh, that word uh, perish is infinitive, so it means have perished, are perishing, will perish. So the extent of his influence is seen on everyone who perishes, literally everybody who d rejects the truth, those who do not love the truth, those that uh, aren't uh, re recipients of the truth. If you don't, those that, those that don't love the word of God, if you don't love the word of God, uh, you know, you're, you're not, you're not you're, you should love the word of God the way you love uh, the Lord, because the Word of God is is living water, is it not? So, so if you don't, you will be caught up in this deception. And in your outline, it says the unregenerate will believe the lie. You know why? Because they always believe a lie. The unregenerate. The reason why it's written like it's written is because the unregenerate have always believed a lie, are still believing a lie, and will believe a lie. And you remember back in John 8, Jesus said to the Jews, you're not of God, you're of your father the devil, and he's a liar from the start. You don't believe the, if you don't believe the truth of God, you believe the lie of the devil. There's only one or two things. It's believe the truth or believe a lie. That's all there is. So this, this class of people, those who are deceived, will succumb uh, to Satan's ploys, and they will perish. Matthew 24, 24. Very important statement made there. Jesus is speaking end times, and he says that there will be people being converted at this time and believing the truth, and it says that this guy will be so formidable, so deceptive, with so many signs and so many wonders, that he will come as if to mislead, if possible, even the who? Even the elect, remember? If possible. Does that mean the elect will be deceived? No, because it's not possible. But everybody else will be received. That's what that means. 
And their blindness is a self-imposed blindness because they do not receive the love of the truth so that they can be saved. And it's it's the only time in the New Testament that phrase is worded that way. It doesn't say they didn't receive the truth, does it? He adds that compelling thought that they didn't receive the love of the truth to show you that true salvation is about what? It's about love. It's a love relationship with a written truth and with truth incarnate. The love of the truth, the gospel, they gave it no welcome in their life. They didn't want it. They didn't love it. If you look back in uh, 2 Thessalonians 1.8, it says that the unsaved do not know God and they don't obey the gospel. They don't know God and they don't obey the gospel and they don't love the truth. John 3, in John 3, uh, John writes that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They reject Christ, his words. They reject his person. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? All right? He is, in fact, Jesus is. Jesus says, I am the way, the only way. I am the truth. I am truth. And I am the life, life. Okay? It's all, he embodies all those attributes. Ephesians 4.21, if indeed you have heard of him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. See, they don't love Jesus. They don't love the truth. Their unbelief, listen, their unbelief is not a matter of their minds. It's not a matter of intellect. It's a heart issue. It's a matter of affection. What are you affectionate for? In fact, we know that they will have heard of it or they will at least have understood it. They may have even thought it was true, but even still, they might not have love for the truth. You know, I sit around sometimes and I talk to people. I get people that call me. I get people that stop, I get people, I have meetings with people, different places, and I have people, uh, when I ask them, do you believe that Jesus is God? Do you believe that he rose, uh, that he died for you, and rose again? Do you believe he's the way of salvation? They will say yes, but they can't go any further. They can't believe the truth, because their affection is on themselves rather than on Jesus. And see, that's the test of ultimate destiny. Do they love the truth? If they love Christ, they'll be saved, and they'll be delivered from Satan's lies and deception and destruction today, just as it will be then. So the guilt is theirs. And all unredeemed people, through, from day one through day whatever, are all under a damning level of satanic deception. Everybody. All unredeemed people on the face of the earth are under da- a damning level of satanic, in your outline, deception. You know why? Because they believe a lie. So... You're not surprised to find folk. I, I'm not, if, if people are like that today, I'm not surprised to find people in the end times being sucked up into the lie of Antichrist because he is the most powerful, the ultimate powerful embodiment of satanic deception in the history of the entire world. All right? And I'll tell you something. You ought to fear the end times if you don't know Jesus Christ. You should be scared. If you're not saved, if you don't love Christ, if you don't love his truth, because when the end time comes, you're going to buy it. You're going to buy his satanic lie. So, <laughs> Pray for free and prepare for code. Pray for free. All right. Uh, okay. So Paul has said here, he says, don't be deceived, don't be forgetful, don't be ignorant, okay? That's what we're saying, he's saying in his letter, this small section of this letter. He says, you're not, 
He's, somebody has come along and said, you're in the day of the Lord. He said, you're not in the day of the Lord. It hasn't come. And it's not going to come until the apostasy happens by this man of lawlessness. You won't be in, and you're not going to be in the day of the Lord because you're going to be raptured before it begins. And the ones who are left, who refuse the love of the truth, will buy the lie, and they're going to occupy the lake of fire along with devil and his angels and Antichrist and the false prophet. So there's a fourth component. Don't be all those things. What did I say those things were? Don't be, uh, don't be ignorant. The last one is, don't be unbelieving. He's warning them. Paul has been in this, at this church physically. I believe the First Thessalonians is written about three months after he's been there. I think Second Thessalonians is written in within six months of his initial trip there but he wants to again make sure don't be an unbeliever don't be unbelieving so that's a warning to anybody he's warning people in the church okay so he's warning anybody in the church then and now who's not a true Christian you need to be a believer don't be an unbeliever he's saying in effect if you're not deceived if you're not forgetful if you're not ignorant you won't be afraid unless you're not a believer because he says at the end of verse 10 that the people who perish are the ones who didn't receive the love of the truth so to be saved. Those who perish means the damned, means the lost. Those who have been set for eternal hell. I think I have a low battery. You think? She asked me, I told her no. Can you hear me? Yeah. Or did I lose juice? Did I lose juice? I thought I lost juice. That was just my head echo. It's nothing up there. So. so, one of the most important statements in all of salvation text is made here. Why do people go to hell? Why do people perish? Why are people punished eternally? And here it is. It, because, it says, because... They did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So whose choice is it? Huh? Theirs. They, and when you read that word received, it means it was offered and they said no thank you. They rejected it. It's their choice and it's an unwillingness to accept the truth. Amen. That's what the word says. Yeah, yeah Renee. Amen. Yeah. You know, intellectually, that's only part of the process. You know, there is no double predestination, and by double tree in theology, when you speak of double predestination, that just means there's those predestined for hell and those predestined for heaven. Now, if I had said and made that statement 15 years ago, I would have said, I would have told you I was crazy, because I was much more of a Calvinist back then. But people perish not because God ordained them to perish. People perish because of their own choice to reject. The truth. The word in your outline is truth. And I believe that scripture is clear on that issue. Going back, for example, Jesus' own words in John 5, 39, Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you can have eternal life. And it is these that bear witness of me. And then he goes on in verse 40. And you are unwilling to come to me that you may have life. You serve the scriptures because you think in the scriptures you can have eternal life. And the scriptures are telling you all about me. They're, 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 they're bearing witness of me. But you're unwilling to come to me that you can have life. See, the problem isn't lack of information. It's never lack of information. You know, Jesus is saying, you search the scriptures, you won't come to me. You know, their opposition, 
their aversion to the truth is not an intellectual ex exercise. Let me say that again. Their opposition, their aversion to the truth is not intellectual. Their opposition to the truth is moral. Make sure you get that. Their resistance to the gospel is not an intellectual. If you sit down with somebody and they take you around and around in a circle about why the gospel is untrue, you might as well leave because their resistance has nothing to do with their intellect. Their resistance is all about their lack of morality. And in John 8, 24, Jesus said this. I said, therefore to you that you shall die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Why do people go to hell? Because they die in their sins. That is, what that means is that their sins are never forgiven, never atoned for, never covered. And so hell is where they must then go to pay for those sins because they haven't accepted Jesus' payment of their sins. So why do they die in their sins? Because they do not believe on Jesus. And why don't they believe him? Because they're not willing to believe. They're unwilling. It's a question of human decision, human choice. And again, I say it's their antipathy, their hostility, their opposition is not intellectual. It's all moral. If you go to somebody and you say, there is a God who loves you. And there's a God who loves you so much that he came into the world in the form of a man to die for you on a cross and pay the penalty for your sins and he wants to forgive you of all your sins, and he wants you to be free from all of your self-guilt and condemnation. He wants you to be free of judgment. He wants you to spend an eternity in glory and bliss and joy and happiness and peace. There are not a lot of people that are going to say, I don't like that. Almost everybody will respond, I like that. I like a God. People like a God who is willing to forgive them of their sins. People get excited about a God who will pay the penalty for their sins so that they won't have to be punished for their sins. People like a God who wants to take their guilt from them. You know, They like a God who wants to give them peace and joy and satisfaction. All of those things, though, all of those likes are intellectually appealing. But the kicker in the story is this. Are you willing then considering you like all these things, are you willing then, willing to abandon those sins, repent of those sins, and turn towards a path of righteousness and embrace Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? You see in your outline, the decision is a moral decision. It's a moral one. It's not an intellectual one. You can give somebody intellectual, the intellectual data of the gospel, like Rene said, like Strobel was talking. He knew he had become a gospel expert in essence, but he also knew that he had to go beyond that and believe it and receive it for it to make a difference. You can give people intellectual data until you're green in the face. But ultimately, you have to confront them and you have to say, will you love the truth or will you love your sin? Because, you know, there's only, and, and I think the word is, is pretty, uh, pretty black and white on the idea. There comes a time and a place where you have to, you have to brush the dust off your feet and go on. Because if you don't, you can lose a lot of valuable time that you could have used helping somebody else. But when you ask that press question, are you ready to love the truth and not love your sin? What you do is you present a moral dilemma. According to John 3.19, the problem is, is that men love darkness more than the light 
because their e deeds are evil. Okay? After God so loved the world, after all that, he says, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Coming to Christ, then, is not an intellectual decision. It's a moral decision. It's a decision that says, and there's people in churches. I know people in, that have been in church for literally decades who have never made a moral decision. They made an intellectual decision decades ago, and they stuck to it. And a moral decision is a decision that says, I will no longer love my sin, but I will love Christ. And back in verse 10 in our source scripture in 2 Thessalonians 2, they perished because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. If they had received the love of the truth, they would be saved. But note this, is, and this is very, very important. In my, in my notes, it's three stars. Whenever I have three stars, it's very important. It doesn't say they did not receive the truth, does it? Does it? It doesn't say that. They, but it, what it does say is they did not receive what? The love of the truth. That's the important word. The love of the truth. In your outline, the word is love. It's a marvelous, that's a, a very enlightening phrase. It's only used here in the gospel, but it tells us what's really involved in accepting Christ in the gospel. They have no desire to be saved. They, they, they choose love of sin, not the truth. So what's the truth? Love of the truth. You've got to understand truth if you're going to love it. Well, certainly it's the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? The truth is something that saves. The love of the truth will bring us to salvation. So it's a saving truth, as the gospel is. But I think you could put, if you wanted to, you could put a capital T there and refer to Christ himself. Love of the capital T, truth. 1 uh, Corinthians 6, 20, 16, 22 says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, he is accursed. You have to love the truth, love Jesus Christ. So it is the truth of the gospel as embodied in the truth, who is the gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's saying to them, if you refuse to love Christ and his saving truth, then you've got a problem because you love your sin. That's, that's from Romans. He's, he's being illuminated. Justin. Put Justin on the prayer list, Arlene. He's close. He's so, close. I can see that. so what Paul is saying is, uh, you guys, don't worry about the Antichrist. You don't, you know, like Dan, you don't need to worry about the Antichrist. You don't need to worry about what's going to be happening in the end when the Antichrist comes with this horrible deception and all that stuff. It's, go it's, it's going to affect the perishing people, not the saved people. And the perishing people are the ones that buy into the lie. And perishing people will get into that deception. Perishing people who, because they do not love the truth so as to be saved, they will love a lie. And that's who that whole thing affects. So if you're not unbelieving, you don't have anything to fear. I have to say that an unbelieving person, you have everything to fear in the coming of Christ. You have to for, re, re, fear the return of Christ in his glory on his day because he's coming in judgment against all ungodly people. And you have to fear the coming of the Antichrist who will delude and, delude and deceive you with all of the deception that wickedness can offer. But here's the true condition of unbeliever. Remember back, I mentioned uh, chapter 1, verse 8. They don't know God. They don't obey the gospel of our Lord, and they don't love the truth. Is that how you would de describe an unbeliever? Doesn't know God, doesn't obey the gospel, doesn't love the truth, doesn't believe in the atoning work of Christ, love their sin, love what they believe. They believe what is in themselves. 
They love the lie of Satan. They hate the gospel. They hate Christ. And it's their choice. And it's a willful choice. And they bear completely the guilt for their refusal of Christ. But as I said, one can receive the truth, but not the love of the truth. One can intellectually apprehend the truth. One can even appreciate the truth and not love it. Ask atheists, do they believe in God? Shake your head, yes, or they're not an atheist. They have apprehended the truth. They even have an appreciation for the truth. But they don't love God. So you have this an illustration. Remember Sunday morning, just so happens, you have the perfect illustration, John 12, 42 and 43. Many of the rulers, quote, many of the rulers believed in Jesus, in him. That, that belief is intellectual. But because of the Pharisees, and this is why it's intellectual, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Remember? That's right. And listen to this, for they love the approval of who? Man, rather than the approval of God. You see, becoming a Christian is loving God and loving Christ and loving the gospel and loving the pr approval of God more than you love anything else. Jesus put it this way. I didn't. Jesus did. Jesus said, if any man loves his father or his mother more than me, he's not worthy to be my disciple. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, if any man loves his father or his mother more than they love me, they're not worthy to be my disciple. It's a, it's, see, Christianity is a loving issue. It's an issue of loving God, loving Christ, loving righteousness. And then, when you're in that position, then you hate sin. But the perishing are perishing because they didn't love, not because they didn't hear, not because they didn't understand, not even because they, couldn't, they didn't see uh, that it could be true or because they didn't have an affirmation of the truth. It's because they didn't love Christ and they didn't hate sin. They preferred to love sin and to love the lies of Satan. And these are people who are deceived by Satan. If you look at the world all around you, you see him everywhere. And as a Christian, you might say, I have a Bible, and it's clear to me, and it's understandable, and it's life-changing, why in the world can't these people see it? What's wrong with them? Well, it's not a question of their mind. It's, a question of, it's not a question of their thinking. It's a question of their morality. They love sin. Unbelievers love sin, and that's what holds them back. And loving sin, they must love lies, because in order to love sin, you have to buy into a lie, don't you? What's the, what's the lie of sin? It's, amen, brother. It's fun. It's beneficial. It's good. Everybody does it. Yeah. Yeah. So the results of this willful unbelief are devastating. Look at, look at verse 11. Here's what Gordy was talking about, and then I'll be done. It says, and for this reason, God will send upon them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. That's powerful, powerful stuff. God is going to send strong delusion because they are unwilling to believe because of their willful refusal to love and obey the truth and be saved. There is going to be a severe divine recompense. He says at the, he says at the end time when the Antichrist comes, those people who have willfully not believed are going to suffer consequences and that consequence is severe. What's the consequence? God is going to send upon them, and this is divine judgment. You could write that in your Bibles if you wanted to. This is an example of divine judgment. God will send upon them, he says he's going to send upon them what? Great deception. Great deception. Okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. What a thought. The sovereign power of God is going to act on unbelievers, and it's, he's going to. Seal their fate. In your outline, he's going to, in your outline, the word is fate. Seal their fate. 
What's he going to send on them? Strong delusion to influence them so they, don't, so they might believe what is false. That's how all these things are going to be happening during the end times and these people are going to be there shaking their fist at God. What, what, what kind of sense does that make? To shake your fist at God. So God is literally, the way this is written, he is literally going to send a force of delusion or deception that's going to cause them to believe what is false. And if you read the book of Revelation, you will remember when Antichrist comes, it says the whole world worships him. Do you know why? <laughs> that's why. Because they have willfully been unbelievers. And then God sends a deluding force that causes them to believe the lie. I don't know. I don't know how that's, that's the one part, that's one of the one part, that's one of several parts that I haven't really, I don't know. I don't think anybody that cries out for the Lord is going to be, yeah. Yeah, but they're, they're kind of, that's toast. They're toast. They're getting close to all those things. Any comments? I don't know what the mark of the beast is. I'm not, I'm not convinced it's a chip yet. Because let's remember, remember the condition of the world during the end times. The world is a total disaster. I don't know if there'll be any electricity. I don't know if there'll be any running water. You know, uh, for a considerable amount of time, the sun's not going to shine, the moon's not shining, the stars ain't shining. So, well, we, it could be as something as, e as easy as a brand. It could be. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Forehead, arm. Yeah. So I. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but the world's just going to be a That's true. a disaster. So. Well, you know, when Antichrist comes to power, it says in Revelation that he devours the world's religions. And everyone is then forced to worship him. Yeah. So, I don't know. I don't know how that works out, Mary. I'm not sure how it... That was, have you, I know you, most of you have left, read Left Behind. Yeah. The scariest part of that book is the pastor who gets left behind. But he reforms pretty quickly. So. That's because he was one of the ones that had the head knowledge. Yeah, not the heart knowledge. 
Yeah, that's why, man, it's important. Our kids and our grandkids, they're, they're going to be confronted by a world that grows ever more evil. It's important to make sure that that word of God is firmly planted in their hearts. Oh yeah. Well, look at it's easy for them to, to deceive you now. Just look at CNN news. Fake news. Most of the news is fake nowadays. Most of it's a lie. Well, there's only one standard for truth, but. <laughs> 